Before I start, I'd like everybody to know tonight that we have Pat Wheatry uh, in the audience. Pat is the president of the Michigan Problem uh, Gambling Association, and he'll be available for questions afterwards. He has a practice in Grand Rapids. I'm from Howell, Michigan. I was raised there with my nine brothers and sisters. We were known as the good Irish Catholic family in town. I come from a family of attorneys. My grandfather, George Burke Sr., was an attorney in Ann Arbor, and to this day, the Burke Law Firm is the oldest existing law firm in all of Washtenaw County. Now, after the Second World War, my grandfather was appointed as a judge at the Nuremberg War Trials, where he actually ended up trying some Nazi war criminals. So when he came back to the United States after that, he had a lot of political clout. Now, my father became an attorney, ended up joining the family law firm, but he didn't care very much for the practice of law. He wanted to do something else. This created a terrible fear of my grandfather. My grandfather was afraid that he was going to be put in a spot where he was going to have to help pay for all of these children that my mom and dad were bringing into the world. So my grandfather decided to use some of that political clout that he had, and he went to the governor of the state of Michigan, and back then it was Soapy Williams, and he asked him if there wasn't some job in state government that would be suitable for a person with my dad's background. Now, as a result of that meeting, my father received a lifetime appointment as the head of the Michigan Liquor Control Commission. Now let me tell you folks something. As an alcoholic, it's a really good thing to be raised in the home of the liquor control commissioner. I grew up in a house where we had 30, 40 cases of beer, wine, and whiskey in our basement at all times. And we were allowed to drink, and from a relatively young age, there was only one provision that went along with that. We could never do anything that would bring embarrassment to dad. Now, that was easy for me. I'm one of those alcoholics, you might have known, who was born with this incredibly high tolerance to alcohol. I could drink and drink and drink, and people couldn't often pick up on the fact that I'd been drinking. This asset came in most handy in my undergrad years. I remember on the weekends, we'd go out to parties, and by the end of the night, all of my friends would be wasted, and I was the only one left standing who appeared to be sober enough to drive all the women home. All of my addictions worked extremely well in the beginning. After undergrad, I came back to Howell where I married my high school sweetheart, Jane. Now, as it turns out, Jane's father was an attorney in Howell. He actually ended up practicing law for over 50 years. So in 1972, when they discussed opening this brand new law school up in Lansing, Jane and I talked it over and we decided I'm going to be the one to carry on the family tradition. And I entered the very first class of Cooley Law School. Now, I knew going into this that I drank too much. I don't think I would ever acknowledge that I had a drinking problem as such, but I knew I drank too much. And that first year of law school is really rough. It's the make it or break it year. If you get through the first year, you can just skate. And I knew that, and I really wanted to be a lawyer, so I had to do something about my drinking. And what I did is I decided I was going to quit. And you know what? It was one of the easiest things I ever did in my life. I used a little bit of willpower, I put it down, and that was the end of it. I quit drinking. And I got through the first year of law school just fine. And of course, that meant in the second and third year, I could go back and start drinking again, which I did do. And you know, it's just like they tell you in any good treatment center, my problems only got worse and worse and worse. After law school, Jane and I moved back to Howell we ended up buying the home that I'd been raised in with my brothers and sisters. Jane is a special education teacher. 
Her classroom was right across the street from where we were living. I started practicing with a couple of buddies of mine from Howell. Office was about one mile away from the house. It was wonderful. It was the greatest life that anybody could ever imagine. I love lawyers. I think they're interesting people. They're fun to be around. They're quirky. They're weird. But I really like lawyers. I love the judges in our community. We just had a great bench. My clients were just incredible. Everything about the practice of law was better than I ever dreamed that it could be. But, of course, I'm starting to have some problems again, and those problems relate to my drinking, of course. Well, it started to get so bad I was having problems at home and at work. And so once again, I'm faced with this decision about my drinking, and it wasn't a hard decision at all. I didn't want to give up the practice of law. So for the second time in my life, I made up my mind to stop drinking. Now this time, I did it a little bit different. This time I told my wife, some of my friends, what I was going to do, you know, to get some support. But this time, it really was different. This time I couldn't stop. No matter how hard I tried, no matter what I did, I couldn't stop drinking. And now I've really gotten myself in a spot because I've told everybody, including my wife, that I was gonna stop. So I became what is known in the field as a closet alcoholic. I started sneaking my booze. I found that if I could purchase one pint of Gordon's vodka a day, I could navigate from the beginning of the day to the end of the day just fine. I could get up in the morning, go down to the office, meet with clients, go to court, argue motions, come home at night, act something like a husband, as long as I had my one pint a day. Alcohol had become my medication. I no longer drank to get high, to have a good time. I drank to get through the day. And it worked for a pretty good period of time but of course, as you all know, things start to change. And I'll never forget one of the first major things that happened to me. It was on a Friday morning in Michigan, one of those god awful cold, freezing Friday mornings. And I was on my way out to circuit court to put on a pro con divorce, one of the easiest things that a lawyer can do. I pull in the parking lot of the courthouse and I go to reach under the passenger side seat and get my pint bottle to take a little shot of courage to go in. And all of a sudden it just hit me. Why am I doing this? Why do I need a drink of vodka to go in a courtroom and put on a pro-con divorce? It didn't make any sense to me. And I decided that morning I wasn't going to do that anymore. So I went into the courthouse, found my client, we had her sworn in, put on the stand and sworn in. I go to put on the proofs. I couldn't do it. My hands were just shaking. Water was running down my face. I couldn't get any words out. The judge saw what was going on and he took mercy on me and he put the proofs on for me. Well, after my client left the courthouse, I remember I walked back into chambers and I apologized to the court for what had gone on and and the judge looked at me and he said, Mike, he said, it's no big deal. He said, I've seen this happen to a lot of young attorneys. He said, you got a little excited. You got a little anxious. He says, you know what? Don't worry about it. It will probably never happen to you again. Well, I remember leaving the courthouse that morning, going out and getting in my car. And I reached under the passenger side seat and there was that bottle of Gordon's vodka. It'd been in there all night long. It was like a block of ice. To this day, I can remember taking the top off and taking that first hit and that wonderful feeling, you know, as it goes down into your chest and it just burns in your stomach. And I remember as I was driving away from the courthouse, I said to myself, I swear to God, I'll never do that again. I swear to God, I'll never do that again. I will never go into a court of law without having a drink first. It wasn't too long after that, I'm on my way out to court again, 
and I've got to stop and get my bottle. Now, for those of you who know it, Howell is a really small town. And back in the 70s, it was a lot smaller than it is today. Everybody knows everybody's business. I could not have the people in this small community thinking that one of their new young attorneys had a drinking problem. So I had eight, nine stores where I could buy my bottle, different party stores, so that nobody would ever pick up on the fact that I might have somewhat of a drinking problem. Well, I remember this morning as I came walking into this party store off Michigan Avenue, and here was the clerk behind the counter bagging groceries. There were three women standing in line. I come in, I'm dressed in a suit. I've got my leather coat that goes down to the floor. And as I go to walk by them to get in the end of the line, the clerk looks at me. He puts down what he's doing, turns around, reaches back into the wall, gets a pint of Gordon's vodka, puts it in a brown paper bag, and handed it between two of the women to me as I went walking by. I looked at him and I thought, you son of a bitch. I had the $2.80 in my hand that that pint of vodka cost. I remember as I was leaving this store that day, though, I figured out how I was going to get even with him. I was going to bankrupt him. I quit buying my booze there. I was back in his store within a week buying another bottle. And then the bottom falls out. That wonderful, beautiful tolerance that I'd had all of my life drops. And now I'm really starting to lose control over my drinking. And I'm getting into a lot of trouble. I'm getting into a lot of trouble at work and at home. It got so bad that one morning Jane left for work. And I'm standing in the kitchen. And I made up my mind I was going to leave her. I went down to the office, I got a quick claim deed, I signed the house over to her, and I got $2,500 out of our joint savings account, and I decided that I was going to move to Las Vegas. Now a lot of people would say, well, why Las Vegas? Well, it was easy. People go out to Las Vegas, they drink, they gamble, they laugh, they have a good time. I had been so miserable for so long, all I wanted to do was go somewhere where I could have a good time again. I left the house that morning, and everything that happens after that is lost in an alcoholic's blackout. The next thing I can recall is I kind of come to, I'm sitting in McCarran Airport in Las Vegas between two of the biggest cops I ever saw in my life. And this one guy is looking at me, and he wants to know what's going on. And I, and I told him, I said, I had gotten into Vegas the night before, and that it was my intention to walk from the airport downtown to one of the casinos where I could drink and gamble and have a good time and have some fun. But that while I was walking downtown from the airport downtown to the casinos, I had been held up at gunpoint, and somebody had stolen all of my money. And he looked at me, and he said, Burke, you're lying. And he said, and it's so simple. He said, I'm going to tell you how I know you're lying. I've been a cop out here for a lot of years. And in all of those years, I have never heard of one single person who walked from McCarran Airport downtown to the casinos. He said, it's five miles. He said, people will take a limousine, a taxi, a bus, they'll run a car. He said, nobody has ever walked from the airport to downtown. He said, now, I will grant that I've heard of a few cases where people have had to walk from the downtown casinos back to the airport. He says, but that's a whole different story. I said, look, it. I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to argue. I just want to go home. Can I call my wife? And he said, sure. And I called Jane, and she wired me out the money for a ticket, and I got on the next flight back to Detroit. Now, I knew that things were going to be very bad because I met in the airport by two of my lawyer buddies. 
And I sat in the back seat on the drive back to Howell. They never turned around, never said one single word to me. Well, we finally get to the house. And I would really love to tell everybody in this room that Jane and I had a discussion. But that's not what happened. Jane looked at me and she said, Michael, you have a terrible drinking problem. If you don't do something about it immediately, our marriage of 10 years is going to end. Well, we lawyers like to say at a point in time like that, that you have a weak negotiating position. I knew I was in trouble. I knew I had to do something. So I agreed to get help. And I agreed to go into Brighton Hospital. Now, Brighton Hospital, back in 1978, was a 30-day inpatient program. And the program literally turned my life around. I learned so much in that 30-day program. I learned what alcohol was. I learned what an alcoholic was. I learned what alcoholism was. Now, some people have said to me, what's the big deal? Well, I'll tell you, here I was, an attorney, sending my clients off to treatment every week. I didn't have a clue. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I learned it all right there. Some of the best lectures I ever heard in my life. One of my favorite lectures was given by Dr. Russell Smith. Russ Smith was a world-renowned speaker on alcoholism. And he did this one presentation on trading addictions. I remember all of the patients are sitting in the chapel and he said, my biggest fear for you folks is that you're gonna walk out of Brighton Hospital, you're gonna leave the addiction that brought you into the hospital right here, and you're gonna go down the road and you're gonna trade it for something else. He said, you people are the ones, if you can smoke it, if you can swallow it, if you can snort it, if you can inhale it, if you can inject it, if you can roll it, he's talking about rolling dice and gambling. He said, you are the people who can become addicted to it. Stay away from it. I bought the program hook, line, and sinker. Brighton Hospital literally turned my life around. The first year after Brighton Hospital, my first daughter, Amy Elizabeth, was born. Today, Amy's 31 years old. She lives out in Los Angeles. She is a fourth generation attorney. She is this tall, beautiful, bright child. It's brought us nothing but joy. Five years later, Katie was born. Katie is a little girl that every dad dreams about having. Katie was that little kid from the time she was small and growing up. She always demanded an answer for whatever question she asked, and it, she demanded rigorous honesty. She'd just get right in your face. Katie might be the most honest little girl I've ever known in my life. I'll tell you how honest Katie is. For the men in here who have young daughters, you're gonna find out as they get a little bit older that there's stuff going on in their lives you really don't wanna know anything about. And you gotta trust me on this. With Katie, if I ever made the mistake of asking her, she would tell me, just total honesty. Today, Katie is a fourth generation teacher. She teaches first grade over in Goebbels, Michigan and lives right outside of Kalamazoo. She is the light into my soul. After Brighton Hospital, I got involved in everything in the local community that I could. I was on the County United Way Board. I worked on the uh, City of Howell Planning Commission. I helped settle a teacher strike in our community. I chaired three school millage elections. I did these things because I wanted my daughters growing up in a community seeing how important it is that you give back to the people who have given you so much. My law practice soared. I left the small firm I was with and I went out on my own. I became what is called a sole practitioner. 
And I started working primarily with alcoholics. Now let me tell you folks something about alcoholics. They make great legal clients. Alcoholics get in trouble unlike anybody else in the world. And it's never just one thing, it's always a whole bunch of things. I never had an alcoholic come into my office with just a drunk driving. Because as we all know, any alcoholic who gets arrested is gonna put up a fight. So you get drunk driving and resisting and obstructing and fleeing and eluding. And that's just the way that alcoholics are. And I figured out why. You see, we alcoholics love to have bombs going off all around us. Because where there's bombs, there's smoke. And when people look at the smoke, they can't be looking at us. These people would come in They'd retain me to represent them. And the very first thing I'd do with them, send them right into Brighton Hospital. I sent so many of my clients to Brighton Hospital over the years, they ended up putting me on the board of directors. I was one of the biggest cash cows that Brighton Hospital ever had. And here's a really cool thing. My clients would get in the hospital, they'd deal with their addiction issues, whatever they were, We'd get their legal matters taken care of. Many of them would be able to save their families. And when they came out of the hospital, I didn't have just clients for the rest of my life. I truly had friends for the rest of my life. It was perfect, except for one thing. And that one thing goes back to the lecture by Russell Smith on trading addictions. And because I didn't pay close enough attention in that particular lecture, I ended up celebrating my 24th year of sobriety, my 25th year of sobriety, and my 26th year of sobriety in Jackson Prison. I'm a compulsive gambler. Now, a little in my defense. Back in 78, when Russ Smith was talking about rolling the dice and gambling, it meant nothing to me. There was no gambling in Michigan back then. We had the lottery. <coughs> the lottery started in 1972. They sold one ticket once a week for 50 cents. I don't think I ever bought one. But you know what? If I want to be honest about it, I've got to tell you my gambling problem really did start the first year after Brighton. Back then, I had a client who had a piece of property down near Miami that he wanted to sell. Simple matter to take care of. All I had to do was call the attorney down in Miami, have them send us the funds, and we would send them down the deed, and it's over and done. No big deal. But that's not the way my addicted little brain works. I got my client in the office, and I said, Ronnie, what do you say instead you and I fly down to Miami, we can sell your property, getting around to golf, maybe have a nice meal, and then that night, we could fly over to Paradise Island in the Bahamas, they've got a little casino over there. And he said, it sounds like a great idea. And you know what, that's what we did, and that's exactly the way it went. Nothing unusual happened. We went to, flew into Miami, sold his property, played some golf, had a great meal. And then we flew over to the Bahamas. They leave you there about four hours, bring you back. Nothing unusual happened until I get home. When I got home, I told my wife and my friends about everything that we did on that trip, except about the casino. I never mentioned it. And every person in this room knows that's a lie. When you withhold information from somebody with the specific intention of deceiving them, it's a lie. It's that simple. The foundation of every addiction is built upon lies. The most important thing I'm going to tell you tonight, the foundation of Every single addiction is built upon lies, 
And I started to build the foundation of my compulsive gambling addiction on that first trip. Now, it wasn't too long after that, Jane and I decide we're going to go out to Las Vegas. You see, Jane did not sit in on the lecture by Russell Smith, and I certainly never told her about it. And back then, in the late 70s, it was a really big deal to travel from one side of the country to the other side of the country to go out to Las Vegas. We were so excited. We told our friends, our families, got our, set up our trip like six weeks in advance. Well, one afternoon, I'm sitting in my office, and I get a call from a buddy of mine. He's president of one of the local banks in Howell, and he wants to have lunch with me. Well, I meet him for lunch, and as we're sitting there, he said, Mike, I hear that you and Jane are going out to Las Vegas. And I said, yeah. He said, listen, how would you like it if I was able to explain to you what you would have to do to get rated as a high roller? Oh, my God. My heart started to pop. It was that same anticipation, that same excitement that I got when I first started drinking that, that same rush. Now, I want everybody in the room to go back 30 years, put some hair up there, high roller. I saw it, I really, I knew that this was something I could do. He explained to me, it, it's, it's relatively simple. He said, after lunch, you gotta go out and buy every book that you can find on playing blackjack. He said, the first chapter of every one of those books is exactly the same. It's entitled Basic Strategy. He said, you learn how to follow, or you learn how to play blackjack following basic strategy. He said, you can never deviate on one single hand. If you do, you will not get rated as a high roller. He said, then, when you get out to Las Vegas, you introduce, introduce yourself to a casino host, tell him you'd like to get rated, he will introduce you to the pit boss, and the pit boss will track your play. He will watch you play for three nights in a row, a minimum of four hours a night, with a minimum bet of $100 a hand. My God, this was, this was me. I knew that this was, this was something I could do. I left that lunch. And I ran out and I got my hands on every blackjack book that I could find. I had them stacked up by the side of my bed. I remember I'd get home from work, eat a little dinner, watch a couple TV shows because that's what normal people do. And then I'd run upstairs and I'd study and I'd study and I'd study. And I became an excellent blackjack player. In over 20 years of playing blackjack, I never deviated from basic strategy on one single hand. I learned how to count cards. I had to learn how to count cards with two and four decks of cards. There were no computers or anything like that back then. I learned money management systems so I could make my money last for the three nights that we were out there. Finally, it came time to go out to Las Vegas. You know what? It worked. It was one of the greatest weekends of my entire life. The desert was beautiful. The hotel we stayed at was the nicest hotel Jane and I had stayed at up to that point in time in our lives. The food was out of this world. The very first Vegas style show we ever saw were these two magicians with wild animals. They were just goofy. Their names were Siegfried and Roy. One of them just got eaten by a lion or tiger a couple of years ago, but, but back then it was, a, it was absolutely a wonderful show. And the gambling, in all honesty, I cannot tell you tonight if I won or lost money. I really don't remember. But what I can tell you about that trip is that on that trip, I got rated as a high roller. Now, let me tell you what that means. A few months later, I'm sitting in my office one afternoon, my secretary brings in the mail, and here is a letter from Harrah's Casino in Lake Tahoe, 
inviting the two of us out for a long weekend. They are going to pay for our flights, our room, our food, and any shows that we want to see because I'm a high roller. Well, to be real honest with you, I didn't know where Lake Tahoe was back then, but I knew we were going. There's no question about that. Now, for those of you who have never been to Tahoe, you first fly into Reno. Now, back then, Reno was this little jerkwater gambling town. You wouldn't wipe your feet on it as you go by, but I remember we walk into the airport, and here's this guy in a suit holding a sign up over his head. It says, Mr. and Mrs. Burke. That's my limousine driver because I'm a high roller. We get outside, and this guy's got a limousine that goes from this podium out through the back wall, and it is loaded with everything that you can imagine, just for the two of us, nobody else. Now, it's about a 40-minute 40 40 drive from Reno out to Tahoe, and it's through the desert. And it's all, it, nothing can live in the desert. It's all just scorched earth. It was really ugly. And you come to the side of this mountain, and you start going up the mountain. And of course, it's still in the desert, so it's still scorched earth, and it's just ugly. But then you crest over the top, and you look down into the valley, and I will tell you, it's one of the most beautiful sights I ever saw in my life. It just takes your breath away. And as we're going down into the valley, our driver turns around and he, he points over there and he says, you guys, you see that little mesa right over there? He said, that is where they actually filmed the opening scenes of Bonanza. I swear to God, I looked over there and I thought I could see little Joe and Hoss Cartwright sitting up on their horses. You know, this was so cool. We get to Harrah's. I don't go through check-in. I'm a high roller. They take us right through up to our suite of rooms. I walk into the dining room, and here on the dining room table is a basket filled with fruit and cheese and just all kinds of wonderful goodies. And then I walk into the bedroom. The TV set is recessed down into the floor. You've got to hit a switch on the wall and it comes up out of the floor. All of this for this young punk kid from Howell, Michigan. The only thing that I could even come close to comparing it to back then, Jane and I had just seen the play Annie about little orphan Annie. And there's this one scene where Annie is finally leaving the orphanage to move into Daddy Warbuck's mansion and she walks in for the first time, and she's looking around in complete awe, and all of a sudden she says, I think I'm gonna like it here. And that was me. I had found my calling in life, the calling of a high roller. Unfortunately, this is where the line really starts in earnest. This is where I really began to build the foundation of my compulsive gambling addiction. But before I can tell you about that, let me tell you just a little bit about my wife, Jane. I told you that I practiced law for 25 years, primarily with alcoholics. I learned something early on about alcoholics. For some reason, a large number of the alcoholics that I worked with had spouses who suffered from no addictions whatsoever, none. You know, and I could never figure out what it is, how they, how they pick us. I don't know if we emanate an odor or, or what it is that we give off, but these people really seem to find us. That's the way Jane is. Jane is addicted to nothing. When we were dating and I was drinking, we'd go out for dinner. And you know, after a really hard day, I might have two, three, some nights, if it was a really bad night, have four drinks, you know, to, to relax and come down after a long, hard day. Jane would order one drink. Now I gotta tell you something. That is a concept to this day I don't understand. Why in God's name would 
anybody order one drink. You can't get high. You can't get a buzz from it. It doesn't taste that good. It's always seemed to me to be such a waste of alcohol. And on those nights when Jane wanted to drive me right over the edge, she'd drink about half of it. And I'd sit there and I'd look across the table at that glass and I just want to reach over and grab it, you know, and knock it down because I knew the busboy was going to have it. Jane felt the same way about gambling that she did about drinking. She didn't like it. She just didn't, she couldn't stand being in the casino. In the beginning, I used to get her one of these little buckets and we'd fill it up with tokens and I took her out on the floor and I showed her how if you put two tokens in, you pull the lever, God, sometimes you hit it and you got some money back. Well, she did that for a while and then one day she said to me, she said, you know, Mike, she said, I really don't like doing that. She said, those tokens, they make your fingers dirty. Well, as it turned out, that was a good thing. She stayed out of the casino and I could gamble my little brains out. Unfortunately, I knew one thing going into that trip for sure. No question about it. If I lost money on that trip, we would never go back out west again. That would be the end of it. So I started a practice on that trip that would continue for the next 14 years. Without Jane's knowledge at all, I brought an extra $4,000 in $100 bills out to Las Vegas with me. And when we're on the charter flight going back to Detroit and the captain asks, do we have any winners on board? I reach in my pocket I pull out the four grand and I gave it to Jane. And she said, oh my God. She said, how wonderful is this? They paid for everything? This trip was totally free and we made $4,000 on top of it? She said, this is the greatest vacation I ever had. And you know what? All predicated upon a lie. And the lie had nothing to do with making Jane feel good. The lie had to do, obviously, with me being able to go out there year after year. The saddest part about it, I think I could have gotten away with it for the rest of my life. You see, I had one of the best practices in Livingston County. I made plenty of money. I had everything that I ever needed or wanted. And we'd only go out there once a year. So even though I lost money gambling and I had to give her money on the trip home each year, I had the whole year to make it up, so it was easy uh, for me to handle that. But that all changed in 1994 with the opening of Casino Windsor. See, they've done a lot of studies on gambling. One of the major studies is called the proximity study. And that shows that every time you open a new casino, the problems associated with uh, pathological gambling will double within a 50 to 60 mile radius of the casino. Casino Windsor is 58 miles from Howell. Now, in the beginning, I would go over to Windsor. I'm sorry, in the beginning, I would sneak over to Windsor a couple days a week. I'd go for a couple hours at a time, take, you know, 300 bucks with me to gamble. Um, play blackjack, just to relax. You know, I work hard, I'm a good husband, I deserve it. Never told anybody that I was going over there. And I literally would sneak through that tunnel and go over for a few hours and just play some blackjack. And I always thought, what's the big deal? Well, let me tell you what the big deal is. If you lose $300 twice a week, that's $600, or in the first year, $30,000, and like any other addiction, it's only going to get worse. And that's what was happening to me. I was losing more money and larger sums of money and spending more time over there until after about four years, five years, I got myself in a position I had never been in before in my life. I was broke and I owed a lot of money. 
I felt that I had no choice back then except to go to some old clients of mine. These people had won the Michigan lottery and they had won a big one. They came to me because they didn't want anybody else knowing who they were for all the obvious reasons. So what I did for them is I just set them up in a trust. And that way, every year for 20 years, the state of Michigan paid their check into the name of the trust. The trust paid the federal and state taxes, sent the rest of the money to them every year. Nobody ever knew who those two people were. To this day, nobody knows who those two people are. They thought I was the greatest lawyer in the world. I told them I needed to borrow $75,000 to get out of a real financial jam that I was in. Let me tell you what kind of people they are. The husband pulled out his checkbook, threw it on the table, drew me out a check on the spot for $75,000, and he said, Mike, you have not only been a great lawyer for us over the years, you've been a wonderful friend. We are not the least bit worried. We know we're going to get our money back from you. I gave them a promissory note, my promissory note, for $75,000. Now, how many of the people in this room think that I took that $75,000 and paid off all my debts? Nah, that's not what an addict does. I am now at the stage of compulsive gambling that they call chasing. In other words, I no longer want to win a yacht or a mansion or anything like that. I want my money back. And that's all I want. And every time I go through the tunnel, and now I'm going over there more often and I'm gambling higher amounts of money, and every time I go through that tunnel, I make the very same prayer. I say, dear God, if you just let me win my money back, I swear to you, I will never gamble again. I swear to you. Well, it's about the same time those two people who lent me the money come into my office to let me know that all of that money that they'd won has not made them happy, and they want to get a divorce, and they asked me if I could handle it. And I said, sure. Well, as it eventually turned out, in the final property settlement of the parties, the wife decided to take as a very small portion of her share of the total estate, she decided to take my promissory note for $75,000. You see, she liked me. She liked me a lot. After the divorce was over and done, she'd come into my office in the morning before my secretary was there, and we'd sit and talk, have coffee. And she was always giving me money. In fact, one day she said to me, she said, you know, Mike, the reason I'm giving you all this money is I know you're going through a very hard time financially. And she says, it makes me feel good to be able to help you out. Well, I wanted her to feel good, so I kept taking the money. This went on for nine months. Finally, one morning, She's sitting there, and before I can even bring up the subject of money, she looked at me and she said, Mike, is this relationship ever going to take a next step? I knew what she was talking about. But now I've got myself in a real jam. You know, I've got to come up with some good reason why we can't have a relationship, or I'm going to lose my gambling money. And I remember I'm just sitting there staring at her, and, staring, and then all of a sudden it just came to me. I looked at her and I said, you know, I'd really like to have a relationship with you, but I can't because I'm Catholic. To this day, I have no idea where that came from. She was absolutely livid. And you know what? Rightfully so. It was the first time that it actually hit her that my only concern was to get as much money out of her as I could for whatever reason, she didn't know. She blew out the door of my office. A few days later, I'm sitting at my desk and I get a call from an attorney in Lansing. He says, Mike, 
I'm sitting here with your client, and we demand you be in this office tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 to discuss the $300,000 you've stolen from her. Well, I get up to his office the next day, and they're both sitting there, and I'm explaining how he really didn't steal her money, how she wanted me to be happy. And, but it was an old timer, and he looked at me and said, Mike, don't even go there. He said, let me tell you how it's going to work from this point on. He said, my client is going to the state bar tomorrow, and she's going to file a grievance against you with the bar. They will determine how you got her money. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sue you in Livingston County for the $300,000 where you live. He said, I imagine that will make a pretty good headline in the local newspaper. Well, I knew I couldn't let that happen, or I'd be exposed for the person I'd become. So we had to come to an agreement, and eventually we did. I agreed to pay her back the $300,000, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to give her $100,000 cash up front, and then I'm going to make payments to her of $15,000 twice a year, $30,000 a year, until the balance is paid in full, and they agreed to that and I avoided public humiliation. There was one problem, the $100,000. Two out of three compulsive gamblers will commit an illegal act to get money with which to gamble or to take care of problems created by their gambling. What I did is I went into my client's escrow account these are funds of money that belong solely to my client. I have absolutely no claim to them at all. And I drew a check out of that account to this woman for $100,000. And when I did it, I did what so many gamblers before me have done. So many gamblers. I convinced myself I was not stealing this money. I was simply going to borrow this money until... I could replace it. Well, of course, there's only one place in the world I can get that kind of money. Back at Casino Windsor. Well, now I have entered into what Dr. Henry Lesseur calls a spiral of compulsive gambling. I'm getting new clients into my office, getting their cases, settling them, getting money as fast as I can to get money into the account to pay the clients who are threatening me physically for their money and still having enough money to get back over to Windsor and gamble. And now I'm gambling more often in larger sums of money. One afternoon, I'm over at Windsor playing blackjack. I've lost about $6,000, and I'm just depressed. I just, all I wanted to do was go somewhere and sit down and figure out how, in God's name, can I get myself out of this mess that I've gotten myself into. Well, I went over and I sat down by a $5 slot machine, got a cup of coffee, and I'm just sitting there, and the gal with the tokens comes by, and I bought a sleeve of tokens from her. And I take out the first two tokens and throw them in the machine and pull the lever, and ding, 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 I hit a jackpot for $10. I won $12,500. Now, I'm sitting there, sipping on my coffee, waiting for them to come clear me the, the machine and pay me my money. All of a sudden, God came down and spoke to me. God said, Michael, the answer to all of your problems are the slots. In the next month, I went from the fives to the twenties to the hundred dollar slot machines. In September of 2000, late one night, I was sitting down at my desk with a 38 up to my head and cocked. 20% of compulsive gamblers actually attempt suicide. It's the highest suicide rate of any addiction. I must sadly tell you tonight, it was the single greatest feeling I've ever had in my life. 
I knew it was going to be over. I knew it would be done. I knew I would not have to explain to my family what had been going on. And as I'm sitting there, I turn around, and on the credenza behind the desk is a picture of my wife and my two daughters. And now I got a problem. Now it hits me. I really believed they could forgive me for if I did one thing to them, but not two. In other words, if it was just committing suicide, I really believed that someday they'd just get over it and they'd forgive me. But then it hit me, what's going to happen after I commit suicide and three or four or five weeks later, these people come looking for their money. Nobody would be around to explain to anybody where it went. Nobody knew what I was doing. And then I, it would be like a Chinese water torture. It would be client after client after client coming in looking for their money. And I honestly believed they could not ever forgive me if I did two things to them. So I had to come up with a better plan. And I had something going for me at the time. I was getting terrible chest pains, terrible chest pains. Knew I was having heart problems. So in the winter months, after the snow had fallen, on Monday night, I've got to take my Mr. Rubbish out to Grand River. It's about 100 yards from my garage out to Grand River. And on those Monday nights, I would load that Mr. Rubbish up with brick and block, anything heavy I could find. And I would literally run it from the garage out to Grand River, but not through the driveway, through the front lawn in the snow. And I could feel my heart just trying to burst all the way. It would take me right to my knees. It was going to be suicide by garbage. But it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't take me. I have now arrived at the end stage of compulsive gambling. It's called being in action. In other words, winning and losing no longer matter. They are totally meaningless. The only thing that matters is that if I can sit in front of that machine and pull that lever and just numb myself out. Just like my pint of Gordon's vodka, the slot machine has become my medication. It's the only time I feel good is when I'm sitting there doing that. I remember one afternoon, I'm sitting over at Windsor at the $100 carousel. There's only one $100 carousel. It has five machines on it. I have hit jackpots on three of the five machines. They owe me between $120,000 and $140,000. I am already on the fourth machine, putting in two tokens as fast as I can, like a crazy person, just out of my mind. And as I'm doing that, a casino host who knew me really well, he'd known me for a number of years, and he was really happy to see that I was finally winning something because he knew how bad it had been for a long time. He came up behind me. And he leaned over and he whispered in my ear and he said, remember, Burke, it's never enough. And you know what? Isn't that the truth about all addiction? Whatever addiction it is that a person suffers from, it can never be enough to cure the problems that it causes. The last month I gambled, I went through $600,000. What's most significant about that is not the amount of money, but the fact that I do not remember being in Casino Windsor one time. Just like when I was drinking, I was having blackouts. I remember getting up in the morning, going in to the banks. I might have to go to seven or eight banks a day to take out seven or 8,000 from each bank. My pockets would be bursting out, stuffed with $100 bills. But I do not remember being inside Casino Windsor one day. And finally, on March 30th, 2001, it all mercifully came to an end. That morning, I got up and I went down to the State Bar of Michigan and I turned myself in to the bar. I left there and I went over to the Michigan Attorney General's office where I met with a prosecutor and an investigator and I spent most of the day there telling them, explaining to them what I'd been doing for the last year, year and a half. And then I had to go home and tell my family. 
My family had no idea, none, that this was going on. Four o'clock, Jane came home from school. I sat her on the sofa in the living room and I'm telling her this story that you've just heard. And as I'm telling her this story, it looked like she was going into a state of shock. But then all of a sudden, and, and believe me, you could see it, it hit her. She knew that things were gonna get very bad, very fast. And the only thing she ever cared about from that point in time on were her daughters, Amy and Katie. At this time, Amy was a senior at the University of Michigan. Katie was a junior in high school. Katie came home about seven o'clock that night, little girl who demands rigorous honesty. She'd been out with some of her friends looking for a dress for the junior prom. I had to sit Katie down in the chair and tell her the story, and as I did, tears ran down her face, her little body just shook. She never said a single word until I finished. And then she turned to her mother and she said, are you going to allow this man to stay in this house? A couple hours later, my brother-in-law came and picked me up, took me over to Ann Arbor and we got Amy. Now you gotta remember, Amy's 21, she's five years older than Katie, she's more out on her own, a lot more independent. And we sat in the back seat on the way back to Howell and all I can remember is I was telling her the story all the way home. She just kept rubbing the back of my hand saying, Dad, don't worry. Someday, everything will be okay again. Someday. On the following Tuesday, I was arraigned on one count of embezzlement of a client's funds over $20,000. And now, wouldn't you know it, now that I don't need it anymore, the heart starts to act up. That night I end up in St. Joe's Hospital and after two days of testing, my cardiologist came in and he said, we have some bad news. You have three major blockages. We're going to have to perform emergency triple bypass surgery on you tomorrow morning. You should talk with your family tonight. A couple hours later, a Catholic priest came in to give me the last rites. I told him to get out of my room. I did not want to be forgiven. I wanted to die, and I wanted to go straight to hell. I felt that was the only punishment appropriate for what I had done. Well, obviously, I get through the surgery, and nine days later, I come home. I remember I'm sitting on the sofa in our living room, and there's a wooden table in front of me with a big bowl on it filled with cards and letters from friends and family. But in the middle of all of it is a letter from Casino Windsor. And I thought, why would they send me a get well card? Well, I opened it up. It was a restraining order, restraining me from coming upon their premises because I was an undesirable person. Now they made a statement to the Detroit Free Press. They said, we don't want people like Mike Burke in our casino. We want the nice, normal, average gambler, the guy who brings in 50 bucks, and if he loses it, he's had a good time, and he goes home. But you know what? That's not really true. You see, 7% of the people who gamble account for 50% of the casino profit. 5% of the people who buy lottery tickets purchase 50% of the lottery tickets. 7% of the people who consume alcohol consume 50% of the alcohol. Addiction is addiction is addiction. It's just that simple. Finally, on June 18th, 2001, in a courtroom where I'd practiced law for 25 years, I was sentenced to serve three to 10 years in Jackson prison in order to repay to my victims the sum of $1.6 million. The next day I was turned over to the Michigan Department of Corrections to start serving that three year term. And I can tell you that every single day I was in prison, 
I was absolutely terrified every day. But you know what? When you get in a spot like that, you've got to make up your mind about what you're going to do. You're just going to end everything or try to make something of it. And that's what I decided I was going to do. I decided I was going to get better physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's what I did in the three years I was there. But what helped me the most? My family. They sent me books on compulsive gambling. And in the three years that I was in Jackson prison, I became an expert in the field of compulsive gambling. I've been home now seven years. Today, I do work at Brighton Hospital. I lecture to the patients. So I've lectured to over 8,000 patients. I do work on behalf of the Michigan Bar Association. Of course, I've been disbarred, so I can't practice law anymore. I do work with the American Bar Association. And a couple years ago, they published my book. The name of the book, oddly, is Never Enough. The two things that I like most about the book is that the proceeds from the book go to my victims. The other thing I really like is chapter seven in the book was written by my daughters. Amy and Katie came to me and they said, you know, Dad, when they knew I was writing the book, they said, you know, Dad, when we went through this, we couldn't find anything to read. We couldn't find anybody to talk to. It was just terrible. We think this book is good, but we'd like to offer something from the family side to give people hope that you can come out of this. So what I do today is I go around the country speaking on compulsive gambling, giving this story a lot to a lot of bar groups, uh, a lot of substance abuse groups, gambling groups, and just people in general uh, who like to hear a story about this and, and become aware of some of the things that are, are going on with the gambling. But the thing that I have found the most joy in, believe it or not, has been at Brighton Hospital. Of the 8,000 alcoholics I've spoken to and given this presentation, I do a screening after each one. 16% identify as currently having a gambling problem. And nationally, it's 12 to 20%. So I'm right in the ballpark uh, with my figures. Just stop and think of that, 16%. That means out of 8,000 patients, I have identified 1,400 people with gambling problems. And you know what's being done for them? Nothing. Nothing. Because insurance doesn't cover it. You know? And that's, that's just the way it is today. But that's how we can find gamblers. And that's how we can find gamblers who haven't had to go to the extent that I have. The gamblers we have who are calling the helpline, they're calling the helpline because everything that they had is gone. That's when a gambler seeks help, when there's nothing left. So not a lot of people want to work with somebody like that, and that's why it's a good thing that we have uh, the state program set up to at least give them 16, basically, free sessions of counseling that, that Pat's going to talk about. But what we truly need in this state is an inpatient treatment center. Because what we have to do is be, we have to be able to break these people from this habit, from this habit, from this addiction. Because it is a devastating addiction. It takes everything. It drains everything out of you. What's most interesting, of the 84% who don't have a gambling problem at Brighton, the majority of them don't gamble at all. They're unlike you. The people in this room, most of you go out and gamble once a year or twice a year at a casino, buy lottery tickets, stuff like that. These alcoholics don't do it at all. And it drove me nuts. I couldn't figure out why are they so different besides the obvious. And then you know what? One day it just came to me. It was so simple. The addiction that brings them into Brighton Hospital 
is working just great. They don't need it. But here's what happens to them. They get out of Brighton Hospital, they get in a good 12-step program, they get into their aftercare program, and then a year or two down the road, they start going to the casino a little bit. They start buying the scratch-offs a little bit. They start going to, how many people know about our charity Texas Hold'em poker rooms? No? Yeah. I mean, I mean they are real. We have 200 of them in the state of Michigan today. They, and there's one, there's one everywhere. And it works. What you have to, under, what I would hope that you'd understand about addicts is that in the beginning, our addictions work. They're wonderful, they're great. They, they do everything that we expect them to do. We control the addiction. And then somewhere down the road, we lose control of the addiction. Addiction takes control of us, and we are done. And that is truly the way that addiction works. And that's what's happening with these uh, alcoholics. They're going out, and they're going to the poker rooms, they're going to the casinos. They're just goofing around with it for a period of time. And then three, four, five, eight years later, they cross that line into addiction and they're done. In the last seven years, the majority of gamblers I have met, the majority come from a substance abuse background, either themselves or somebody in their family. If we really want to do something about dealing with this extremely small percentage of people who have a gambling problem, large number, but small percentage. It's simple. We just start hitting the people in recovery before they start. At the bottom of my screening, I have a spot for the uh, patients uh, to make comments. And I literally have hundreds of these sheets that say the same thing. They say, Dear Mr. Burke, I don't gamble, I've never gambled, and after hearing your presentation, I never will gamble. That's how we can help gamblers. Get the word to them before it starts. Works with other substances, doesn't it? You know, why not do the same thing with, and not just gambling, ladies and gentlemen, all of the process addictions, the pornography, the sex, the shoplifting, you know. Let's face all of these and, and understand that they will take us back into the addiction. I'm going to bring Pat up in a minute, but I want to tell you one interesting thing about the study that I'm finding out. The people who come into Brighton Hospital with co-occurring conditions, gambling and drinking, if they go out and they gamble, they will drink again. The 84 percenters who come out of Brighton Hospital is recovering alcoholics who've never gambled before. If they gamble, they don't drink. They don't drink. Isn't, isn't that interesting? If you know, if you have a family member with a problem, or you know somebody's got a family member with a problem, you tell the spouse who doesn't have a problem to tie up the money. Don't believe your spouse if he says he's not, he or she's not going to do it again because they will. Tie up the money or it will be gone. 